Okay, hold on. All right, now it's recording. Okay, welcome to the D Sh- podcast on D Shot. Um, starting this with a lot of sp- some sports talk or some sports previews, some interviews and such. Uh, first guest is Kevin Holden. So, Kevin, um, welcome. Hey, thanks for having me, man. I didn't, I didn't know this was the debut. I'm, I'm kind of honored to be in the first one here. Yeah, I was either it was either going to be you or um, Thunder because it would have been interesting to get somebody that uh, is a pa- Patriots nut. <laughs> <laughs> That would have made him uncomfortable. (laughs) That's funny. Um, So let's just kind of just talk about the Super Bowl. Um, Obviously, it looked to me, it seemed like it was one offense was kind of fluid throughout. And you kind of, um, obviously, going into the game, it was big nodes. Defense was kind of what people were mostly talking about. But Bowles was kind of the defensive coordinator that ended up showing up. So just kind of um, give your thoughts on what your thoughts were about the Super Bowl. You know, I, I, I'm not 100% shocked. I'm actually not shocked at all that, uh, that Tom Brady was as good as he was on a stage that big because, uh, you know, even at that age, uh, he still got a lot in the tank. So it's not a shock to me. But, but you mentioned defense. And here's where the, difference, <clears throat> where the difference lies because everyone talked about Brady and Gronk and they talked about Leonard Fournette and Antonio Brown and all the different weapons that that Buccaneers offense had. But as, as uh, Packers fans learned, it was the Buccaneers defense. That was the difference maker. Uh, first of all, Antoine Winfield jr. Is uh, he's a guy, uh, he's going to be a guy to be watching for quite a long time. <clears throat> One of the top rookies in the league. And I think that that'll get a lot better. But as you said too, Todd Bowles, who, who has uh, sort of recycled through the league a couple of times, he's been a head coach before and uh, sort of flamed out in that role, just was in a zone as a, a defensive coordinator. And it's a combination of uh, experience in the big games and also experience on the field. Because remember, you've got these guys like JPP, you've got Indomitian Sue, you've got guys with a ton of experience that, that came to play this game. So uh, I, I got to admit, in this era, when all we do is talk about quarterbacks, I was kind of happy to see defenses be the, the center stage. And the, and the Bucks took it to Patrick Mahomes and the Chiefs. It was an impressive performance. Um, kind of with the outside of Tom Brady, um, what do you think was kind of the – some of the biggest story storylines that we got out of the Super Bowl. Obviously, we had four the four guys that scored for the um, Buccaneers. I feel tempted to say Patriots somehow, but um, all those four guys weren't on the Buccaneers last year. Um, kind of just what what's one of your kind of interesting storylines that came out of the Super Bowl? Well, and and the reason why you say Patriots is because Brady and Gronk had two touchdowns they they connected for two touchdowns and that's a storyline we've said how many times when they were both in new england uh to me this was a very interesting legacy moment and i think that's the takeaway that i'll i'll have from this uh not that tom brady's a champion i think we knew that if he never won another super bowl we would know that he's one of the best to ever play the game but the fact that he did it in a new place separate from the structure that he had all those years in New England. No Bill Belichick, none of the other Patriots stuff that goes on. He decided he was going to take his talents to a different part of Florida and then recruit those guys. You know, you mentioned that uh, that that Brown and Fournette and Gronk, those guys were not Patriots or were not Buccaneers last year. Uh, Brady had a hand in recruiting all of them to join uh, up with this Buccaneers team. So Brady won a championship by joining a new team and bringing the gang along. And, uh, and it was, it was interesting to see that happen. It's almost an NBA ish storyline where guys get together in a different city and they win a title, like in Miami, when, uh, when they had all that talent with the heat, uh, it just to me, it shows love him or hate him. The storyline that you walk away with is Tom Brady is, is, if he isn't the best to play this game, he is certainly in that conversation. And, and uh, I, I think he would have been there anyway, but to win a title in a second place, uh, that's, that cements the legacy to me. I was going to add to that. It's kind of weird that Tom Brady's only had three kickers in his NFL career. <laughs> Ryan Suckup, Adam Venateri, and um, Gostowski. Yeah. It's Maybe weird to think about that in 20 yeah, years. Right. And 20 years with three kickers. 
uh, and and it's you know if you go back and look to like this is to, to me the testament to Brady's career. If you go back and look at the the uh, the first championship, which would have been the 2001 season, 2002 Super Bowl, that's like a hundred years ago. Like you look at the video from that game, you look at the the replays, like the the presentation, everything looks different. That game, even though it was 20 years, that game looks like it's 50 years ago. It's like a different era, man. That game's so old. It was Pat Summerall on the play-by-play call. <laughs> <laughs> it was. It was four months after 9/11. I mean, that was forever ago. And then I was. Uh, if I could share a real quick story, I was actually uh, a media member for Brady's second Super Bowl. That was Super Bowl 38 in Houston against the the Panthers. And I remember thinking then, like, okay, Tom Brady's won two Super Bowls, and he's in his at the time he was in his mid 20s. It's like. Uh, yeah, he's got a chance to be a pretty good quarterback. I had no idea that we'd be talking about five more. I was going to kind of add on to storylines. And one of them I thought about was Antonio Brown, because he signed, he leaves the Steelers, goes to the Raiders, has the falling out with Mayock and Gruden, has all this other social media and the sexual assault thing, um, was on the Patriots for a little bit. And then we didn't know what was going to happen with him and he, with whether he was going to come back to the league and lo and behold, he comes back back and wins the Super Bowl and catches the touchdown. It's, it's amazing to me that, and this isn't the first time we've seen this. It's amazing to me that when you get someone, an athlete who uh, is disgruntled, goes through personal problems, goes through issues, how sometimes they can go from spot to spot to spot and have those problems but then they can join a specific organization, a specific uh, team in a situation and, and they can be fine. I mean, we, we saw it, uh, you know, Josh Gordon was going through something similar. He was going through all those problems with the Browns. I mean, you can go back to, and this is an old reference, but you can go back to, uh, to Gary Sheffield who, who had uh, in his San Diego portion of his career had had kind of a, a rough reputation as a teammate uh, and then when he joined those teams in Atlanta, those Braves teams that were winners every year, Sheffield, you didn't hear from him. You know, you didn't you didn't really hear anything. And that's what I think of with Antonio Brown. These these weeks and months leading in here to the Super Bowl, you didn't hear a whole lot. And and uh, he's the kind of guy. Brown is the kind of guy, and it's been proven in his career. He's got the talent that if the other stuff is quiet, he's going to be a performer. And and it was good to see for him on a personal level to uh, to sort of uh, atone for some of these things with a touchdown in the Super Bowl. Um, obviously, the other story that came out obviously came out yesterday was the streaker. Um, props to Kevin Holden or Kevin what uh, Kevin Harlan, excuse me. <laughs> on uh, what would be interesting to see you call call that as well, but. Um, get, get you called it in Spanish would have been interesting. Um, but, uh, just that, um, streaker running on the field, apparently that he bet on himself and won $375 or $300,000 doing that. <laughs> so, so that bet ruined, right? Like yeah. there's nobody Vegas ever takes that bet like ever again, uh, for anyone because he he basically influenced the outcome of the bet on his own I, I I hope that's not like the beginning of the end for Super Bowl prop bets because I really do like the the uh the the, the way the prop bets are set up there was one that I saw where it was like somebody put money on uh whether the word kindergarten would be said in the broadcast you know like down to the the very specifics of it uh, so streakers are, are not an unusual thing uh, in in the Super Bowl. Uh, not not I don't want to make this the Super Bowl 38 podcast or anything, but I'm going to jump back to that game for a second. That one I was telling you about in Houston uh, was Brady's second Super Bowl. Everyone remembers Super Bowl 38 for what happened in the halftime show with Justin Timberlake and Janet Jackson. That's that's the moment, right? immediately the networks cut to commercial immediately. I mean, the, you know, they had to, right. I mean, it was a, one of these shocking moments in the history of television. So I'm in the stadium and, and I'm here to tell you that you would not know this because it's lost to history, but seconds after the wardrobe malfunction, there was a streaker. Uh, he, he ran out on the opposite side of the field. Um, it would be the, I, 
I've got it right. It's the south end zone. What happened with Janet Jackson was up near the north end zone. And then as soon as they went to break, the streaker comes out of the south end zone. And, uh, and they chased him around for about a minute and a half. And it has to be the most unfortunate streaker in the history of man, because that was the, di- the duration of the commercial break. It was 90 seconds. Like, they chased him around. They tackled him. They took him off. And by the time network TV resumed, you never knew. And uh, so I, I thought it was funny. This streaker actually understood his timing. He got his due on TV because the Super Bowl 38 streaker had the worst timing in history. Uh, we talk about streakers. I know from the Packers side of things, do you remember the game when uh, the Packers were playing the Bengals and it's like last possession and some streaker runs out onto the field and takes the ball from Favre? Oh, yeah. Didn't he, <laughs> he, did he get laid out or am I thinking of a different one? I don't remember. I have to go back to the video. Uh, now, now That's the I, one that sticks out from a Packers side. I thought where you were going was the preseason a couple of years ago. And that's when I did call, actually, uh, Packers preseason game. There was He wasn't a full streaker. He had, you know, he was he had pants on. Mm. Uh, but he was out on the field. And there's a, there is a picture. The Journal Sentinel photographer took a picture of that guy. Um, you know, he, he imbibed, I'm sure. And uh, the, the picture is a cop on each arm. And, and this dude's like tongue is hanging out. He's just, I just, you know, that dude was living his best life in that moment. And I always wondered, like, I, you know, what, what was that dude's life like six hours later? Did he end up in a, in a cell and he was like, yeah, I suppose that wasn't a good idea. <laughs> but it, it seemed like a good one at the time. I can't believe I messed up Kevin Harlan with Kevin Holden. Not the first time. <laughs> <laughs> Not the first time I've gotten it before. <laughs> okay. Um, let's, let's talk about the Packers season a little bit, obviously, um, how it ended. I mean, felt like Favre in the NFC Championship game where Favre could have run a couple yards and set up a 56-yard field goal um, for Ryan Longwell. Um, just let's just talk about that ending a little bit and what you kind of thought about it. Uh, you're talking about this one that just happened the against the Buccaneers yeah yeah it's uh you know it's it's kind of a rabbit hole uh because the 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 plays are running for the end zone on third down and then electing to kick the field goal on fourth down to make it a five-point game and it's going to be a controversial decision where you and I are going to talk about this generations from now that's going to be what we remember from this season uh, the interesting thing about that, though, is it's it, the rabbit hole started earlier. The rabbit hole to me started when the Packers went for two uh, and didn't get it a little bit earlier in the half. And it put them down. It, I mean, it, when they got to that last possession, they were down eight instead of seven. Uh, to me, that makes an, an enormous difference. Now, I'm trying my best to see this from the pro side. I don't agree with the call, but I, but I would best try my best to see it from the pro side. And this is how I see the pro side. If you are absolutely perfect on fourth down, you do something you haven't done on first, second, or third down. You score a touchdown against a defense that has had been bucking up. They looked good. And then you have to go for the two-point conversion. You have to get it. And then you give the ball to Brady with two minutes to go. And all he needs is a field goal to win the game. So it's still not a great situation. That's that. That's me taking the opposite side. Remember debate club when you took the mm. opposite side? That's me taking the opposite side to try to rationale it through. It wasn't a great situation either way because you score, you go for two, you give them the ball. And again, you're putting the ball in the hands of one of the all-time greats at comebacks in history. Um, so that would be the, the, the flip side for me. All of that being said, I still would have gone for it. And, and going back to your point about Rodgers going for the end zone on third down, uh, I think that the point a lot of people make is if he doesn't score, he gains four or five or six yards and you're on the two and it changes everything. That 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 to me might be where the, again, it's a rabbit hole. That is the mistake that leads to the next decision that leads to the next mistake. And um, it's, it was unfortunate because it wiped out what I thought was a really good Packers season. I thought defensively they were better. I thought Aaron Rodgers, I mean, he is the MVP and he showed it during the year. He played, you know, at a, at a level that even for him was terrific. And I hope all of that doesn't get wiped out in history because it was a great season. I was, I was going to say, at least if there was an offensive coordinator at Whitewater, I always had an issue with his play calls because you'd always run it on third and 
lawns. And I'm like, I think in that situation, I would have been actually for somebody running the ball on third down just to get you closer and a better shot. Yeah, some yards, right? Some yards. Um, I would probably think, you know, it's kind of impressive that the receiving core that they had, even though I would have wished we would have kept Kumi, um, that you kind of saw Marquez Valdez-Scantling get some big catches throughout the season, even though he had kind of the stinker, Brandon Bostic type thing um, in that um, game, one of the games we lost. Um, it been, it, I was seeing some draft mocks and – they had one of the NFL.com draft mocks had us picking a corner instead of a wide receiver. So I think it kind of speaks volumes to that. They were able to step up. Yeah. And I, I, I hate to, I don't want to go down this road as a blame game, but I'm curious to know what Devin Funches would have looked like for the 2020 Green Bay Packers. I'm not saying I'm blaming Funches or any athlete that decided to, to step away uh, during the 2020 season. Um, but, uh, I, I'm just curious. I, I think it might've, there's a domino effect. If Devin Funches settles in as a really, really strong number two receiver and Adams has that year that he had as an elite number one receiver, everybody else works their way down that chart. Your second receiver becomes your third receiver, which means he's a bigger problem for the third defensive back, the third option to guard him. Right. That that's what I mean is not that Devin Funches would have been an MVP, but Devin Funches would have made five other guys slide down a slot and, and be tougher, you know, offensively. So I, I think it would have been interesting to see, see what he would have done. Again, I, this is not a blame game. Uh, athletes that are uncomfortable playing in, in, you know, in the era of COVID, I, I can't fault them for that. But, but it did affect the receiving game. Do we get him back next year? Do we get Funches back next year? Wasn't yeah, that a one, one year? year? I think I thought there was one more. I think they can get him back. Back. Okay. And, and uh, hopefully the world is, is you know, uh, more normal <laughs> by August or September and we can we don't have to worry about opting out, you know. OK, so we talked about the Packers. We talked about the Super Bowl. Um, let's talk NFL offseason. Um, what was the coaching hire that stuck out to you the most? Oh, now you're talking about for the for the coming year. Yeah, the, the new guys. I would go oh. Urban Meyer because, you know, he's going to get uh, Trevor Lawrence at quarterback and be in, hopefully he can kind of be one of the few college coaches that can actually have success in the NFL. But that would be the one I would go with. Yeah, I think I think you're that's the biggest splash, right? Like that's the that's the franchise that was in the biggest need of the biggest name. Somebody to to not just help turn things around, but to literally be a face of the franchise because they have been faceless for a long time. Um, I, th that will be the most interesting to see because Jacksonville has had some talent uh, off and on. It, remember, it wasn't that long ago, they were in the AFC Championship game. <laughs> With Blake Bortles as his quarterback. Right. Like that was a team that was, that was there. Now, I, here's, a, here's an interesting question. I don't know the answer to this. But Bortles is a um, Bortles was a product of the Orlando area, Oviedo High School, uh, in just north of Orlando. So he was local. But there is another quarterback that's also local to there, and I am not saying that Tim Tebow is going to be the starting quarterback for anyone at this stage in his career. But do you think that that maybe Urban is going to have a place for Tebow somewhere, a coach, something? He's from it, ha there. it would have to be as a coach because I don't, I don't, I don't know if that would work from a quarterback side. Yeah, it didn't work the first time. Yeah, and he's like, he's just thirty, and, and he's more of a baseball guy right now with, right with yeah. the Mets. He's trying, man. He's, yeah, it's funny to watch because he's, you know, I mean, he's, you know, six, he's six six and like two sixties, like. He looks like Adam Dunn in a baseball uniform. He's massive, but as a you know, as an NFL quarterback, he's another quarterback. He was just another, you know, another body in that in that role. I just I don't like I said I don't I'm not talking about a resumption of his playing career, but you know, Urban Meyer and Tim Tebow won a national championship together. Technically, they won two. I uh, I wonder I wonder if Tim Tebow is going home to Jacksonville to be the quality like, control assistant or something. You know, be like John Gruden. Right. <laughs> um, I was going to say Robert Sala would probably be the second guy. 
I'm glad he got an opportunity. Uh, it's because, you know, and we saw it firsthand, you know, Packers fans did uh, seeing them, you know, face the 49ers and all the stuff that that's gone on there. They, they had a good run too. They had a bad year this past year, but that's been a good team with a good base. Uh, and uh, so it was nice to, to see him get it. It's nice when you see a coach that deserves that opportunity, get it at the right time, not too late. And I think it's going to be a perfect time for him. The other one I'm going to throw in there, Dan Campbell, who had like the one of the most interesting press conferences that you've probably seen in a while. He was a member of the that 0-16 Lions team, him taking over in Detroit would be the other one. Yeah, the when uh, yeah there was this this just very like like okay what's gonna happen next vibe around him it's uh, it wasn't we're gonna bite your kneecaps right it was, that was it, the it, that was the bite yeah <laughs> bite your kneecaps you you know what it is it's like it's like a six on the Adam Gase scale because Adam Gase was like a twelve like on a on a one to ten like Adam Gase with those crazy eyes. Like Jets fans had to be scared to death. Like, what is this man going to do to my franchise? <laughs> I would say the biggest dis- disappointment out of the NFL coaching side of things is that Eric B didn't get a job. We didn't see Leslie Frazier get a job either. Um, so those be the two that kind of, those two guys better be the next two guys next year when we're looking at NFL coaches. Hires. It, would be, it would be nice. Uh, it would be nice to see, uh, across all of, of pro sports, but I think uh, I think the focus right now is especially in the in the realm of the NFL and specifically in the realm of the NFL head coach. Um, I I think we've you know in 2021 we've arrived at an era and it's a nice era where uh, opportunity should be opportunity and it shouldn't be based on anything else. It's opportunity and uh, and so when when you are giving opportunity to, to the guys that deserve it. Uh, and, and the other factors come out of it, it's, it's going to be really nice. I'm with you. I, there are plenty of NFL franchises that, that you know, need, that, that are desperate to win. So why not go get talent? And, you know, if you want to break some ground along the way, that's great. But, but go, you know, go, go get the opportunity. Go make it happen. All right. So in terms of the offseason moves so far, um, you have Stafford and Goff being swapped. Uh, there's all these rumors with what's going to happen with Wentz, what's going to happen with Watson. Um, you can even throw a Trubisky in the net mix because we don't know what's going to happen in Chicago. Um, I was going to throw Russell Wilson because there was a report about some of the things going on there, um, but it looks like he's probably going to stay. So just kind of talk about those what you think happens with some of those other quarterbacks and who won the Lions Rams trade. You know, here's the thing. I, I, I have always liked Matthew Stafford. I think Matthew Stafford has taken some, uh, has taken a franchise that was in turmoil for a long time. And, you know, he didn't, he didn't make him a Super Bowl contender. He didn't make him a playoff team on an annual basis, but he made him dangerous. And, and the, the Lions were always in that. I mean, you remember every year, the Lions were always in that discussion where it's like, Hey, watch out for them this year. They're going to be pretty good, you know, and it will be interesting to see that quarterback in a different system, that quarterback with a different ability to do, uh, to do some things in LA. I also, I mean, I think golf is, is, is going to be fine. It's going to be serviceable in Detroit, but, but I also think Detroit is a, is a system and an idea a situation that's going to take a couple of years. I think the Rams want to do this right now. And I think that matchup is, is the, of Stafford with what's already there in place in LA, uh, you know, the McVay offense is going to be pretty good. And, and that, that to me is where that win happens is that, uh, you know, the, the Super Bowl's in LA next year. The Rams would really like to play in it. They just saw how fun it is to play a, a Super Bowl in the stadium you normally play in. So I, I do like the, the Stafford addition. Uh, as far as the other guys, <laughs> I mean, Carson Wentz uh, has Carson Wentz is a, is, is one of these like recency bias kind of quarterbacks, right? Like, okay. So you may not have been thrilled with what Carson Wentz did. If you're an Eagles fan over the last year or so. Uh, And especially in the last few months, because that's broken apart that franchise. Uh, But Carson Wentz is a winner. Carson Wentz needs to play. 
And he needs to play for somebody who's competitive right now. He doesn't need to go to a team that was two and 14 last year. So I, I, I think Carson Wentz can help a contender and I think he will help a contender. And Deshaun Watson's in the same group. And man, I, I you know, I've got buddies uh, from when I worked in Houston and they, one of them was texting me yesterday and he said, you know what, if they trade Watson, I am, I, the, the Jersey is going blank. I'm going to try to find a new franchise to support. He said, cause it's, it's a total mess. I mean, that's a, that's a quarterback that that's asking for some help. And remember, he's not the only one in that franchise that was essentially begging for some help. Our, our you know, Wisconsin native JJ Watt gave us a little insight into how bad things were in Houston. So uh, I, I think Wentz ends up, oh man, I, <laughs> that's a, that's going to be interesting to see exactly where, but somebody that, that needs a quarterback and, and wants to win now, Denver, I don't know. Uh, Indy. And, yeah, no, that's a really good one. Yeah, Indy. that's been brought up on the Pat McAfee show. That's not a bad idea, and and Indy shows that that they that they're not afraid to to import somebody, right? This Philip Rivers thing showed that if you're a quarterback and you can do something and you want a good system, you can join it. Um, Deshaun, I, I mean, they're, they're going to be at the mercy of the of the Texans. That's the problem, right? The trade is the issue there. Um, would you be shocked to see Watson as a Bear? Not really, because that would be kind of like redemption on the Bears' side, considering they could have drafted him, they could have drafted Mahomes. Right. It just would show a lot of redemption. Like, like I feel like that's a fan base move, right? Yeah. It, not, not that Watson wouldn't be fine as a quarterback. I think he'd be fine. But it's a fan base move. It's it, The fans in Chicago have spent years going, oh, we could have had those guys, and here we're watching Mitch Trubisky underthrow a receiver. It's wide open on third and six. I, you know. I feel like it's a move for them. Also, as a Packers fan, I'm like, do we have to have another good quarterback in the in the NFC North? Like there, Goff's in great. Detroit, Watson would be in Chicago. Like, I mean, and I think Kirk Cousins might end up gone. By the way, what San Francisco is an interesting situation too with Garoppolo, and there there's some questions and swirling going on there. Like, I, the, I, maybe Kirk Cousins is a Niner by this point in September. Maybe Garoppolo goes to the Patriots. I can see that. Yeah. I mean, they, they really, really wanted to, to keep him. I mean, some faction of the new England party really wanted to keep him around and you can understand why. Uh, I would, I'm going to kind of give my takes on some of this is I think the Rams probably won the, the lot, the quarterback swap. Cause I think there's a lot more to build off of with, they have Cooper cup. They had a um, good couple good receivers and running back. You can look on the Lions side. Um, DeAndre Swift was pretty good for them this year, but you don't really know. Um, is Kenny Galladay going to be back? Because isn't he a free agent? They still got Marvin William, Mar Marvin Jones. I don't know why I'm throwing a basketball guy in there. Um, <laughs> but I think that that's kind of uh, in between. But I think, you know, with the Rams making the playoffs, they kind of um, – that I think they won that trade. Yeah, it makes uh, a lot of I was going to say, do you want to do something fun for the end of this or wait, we got, we, um, or do you want to talk the draft quick and well, we can, we can touch on the draft if you want. Okay. So um, what positions do you think the Packers need to look at in the draft? I mean, receiver is still Funches or no receiver is still a position that, that I think they've got to, to go and address. And I, they're, at this point, there's a, there's a lot of maintenance sort of selections, meaning you are going to cycle through in the course of the physical nature of NFL seasons. You're going to cycle through offensive linemen. You are going to cycle through defensive backs. And I think those are the two things that they've, they've got to focus on. Uh, I, have, uh, I have fallen out of the trap of linebacker, 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 because I, I used to scream that every year, and I just – I've, I've come to the conclusion that it's going to be what it is. Like if Christian Kirksey is your guy in the middle, just plug him and let's go. Uh, that I don't, I don't want to waste an early pick at that position. So I, I think receiver is one. And then just let me, let me get some offensive linemen and some defensive backs that'll, that'll be in place a couple of years down the line. I would go corner because we're probably going to lose Kevin King running back would probably be one of, wouldn't be surprising with me. You know, you don't know, What's going to happen with Aaron Jones? What's going to happen with Jamal Williams? I wouldn't be surprised there. Um, offensive linemen would be interesting because I would be pulling for Quinn Miners to get drafted by the Packers to get another Whitewater-related Packers jersey. But 
I'm just curious, where do you, where do you see Quinn Miners after a senior bowl performance and all that kind of, where do you think he, he goes? It was fun to see him pushing people around. When <laughs> <laughs> he became an instant story. Uh, and it was fun. Um, I, who knows? I mean, the, the NFL is based so much around these, these things that they measure in the combine, right? I mean, I, I, I feel like, and obviously there's a science to it, but I feel like there's, it has, it has everything to do with what those numbers say uh, and, and how the player performs in those numbers. And I know they go through the wonderlick and all that other stuff. So it's, it, it's really not, not knowing what the combine is going to look like for him. It's going to be weird for me to, to tell. I think it gets taken somewhere. I mean, you know, like someone late in the draft will, will have a little fun with the, with the splash there. And then the guys on the draft broadcast will be like, Oh, that's the guy that was pushing people around the senior bowl. You know, that's, it, it's coming. It's just maybe a sixth or seventh. And I don't know if he has a great combine, maybe he jumps. I saw a prediction. It was to the bills in the third round, right after the Packers. Oh, that wouldn't be bad. Third would be all right. That would be joining Kumaro. You'd have two yeah. whitewater guys on the same NFL roster. Right. But either way, he could be the first guy since Derek Stanley. I have that jersey laying around somewhere. I won that in uh, Whitewater Athletics auction. Right. Uh, awesome. So let's do the fun thing. Um, I guess the name fives. Um, I don't know where you want to start because I got um, like Patriots t- or Tom Brady's teammates would be one. Tom Brady's receivers would be another. And maybe we could do name as many Packers as we could or something like that. Yeah, I like it. All right. So, uh, yeah, so start me off. I'm, I'm all yours. Okay. So what do you want to do first? I'll go, I'll go with, uh, with Brady's, uh, Brady's top five receivers. Cause I kind of like that idea. Um, we're well, talking I'm just, I'm just saying like you, I would name five and then they'd be off the board. So oh. like I'm saying like teammates would be really easy cause there's so yeah. many of them. Any position, but maybe receiver. I don't know. Maybe, maybe we'll go a different way. What would you have for Packers? Um, I don't know. We could just name five and see where we go. Like you name five and then those five are off the board. Five. Uh, Doesn't yeah. matter. So I've done yeah, that with, one. I've done that with Brewers. So I was in a whitewater bar once and I did this with baseball players at whitewater and we like, did Brewers players since 2003. And I think I kind of whooped them because I would get to like the Trent Durantons of the world. Uh, <laughs> oh, it's fantastic. Yeah, yeah, I'm all yours. Go for okay, it. Okay, so do you want to go Packers or do you want to go Tom Brady? I'd, I'd be interested in going Tom Brady. Brady, yeah, Brady uh, receivers. Is that the thought? Brady targets? I'd say teammates. Teammates, teammates. would be. All right, okay. so the name five Tom Brady teammates. I'm going to go Brewski, Variable, um, Roosevelt Colvin, William McGinnis, and Deion Branch. Oh, you, went, you went kind of like back a little right off the top. Good for you, man. Uh, all right, let's go. Kevin Falk, James White, um, you, you see what I'm doing here, <laughs> Lawrence Maroney, uh, Leonard Fournette, and uh, Thomas Jones, all running backs. <laughs> okay. Um, do you mean Ronald Jones? Ronald Jones, Thomas Jones. Okay, okay. yeah. Because Thomas Jones was like a jet and a bear, if I can remember <laughs> correctly. Um, Randy Moss, Wes Welker, um, David Padden, David Givens. Um, Troy Brown. All right. So we haven't, we have not done Rob Gronkowski. Uh, and, uh, and so then I also do well, Aaron Hernandez and Cameron break because you're talking tight ends. Um, and then I'll give you some Jason Pierre, Paul and, uh, and Dama King Sue. Okay. Christian Fourier, um, Martellus Bennett, Daniel Graham. Um, I was playing NFL 2k five recently. So I'll say, I saw on that they had Cliff Kinsbury as his backup quarterback one year. <laughs> <laughs> and wow. I'll, go, I'll go Brian Hoyer. So yeah, you're hitting just backup quarterbacks. <laughs> all, right. all right. Yeah. So if you're, if you're doing that, then I, then I need to go like, well, if you did Hoyer, I, I got Jimmy Garoppolo, obviously. Um, and then, uh, then my other thought is, uh, is our, our kickers we were talking about, Ryan Suckup, uh, Steven Goskowski and Adam Vinatieri. That's four. I need to, I need to dig and come up with one more. How about Ty Law? Have you said Ty Law? Oh yeah, he's in. He was in that two K five game. Um, Eugene Wilson. He was a safety. Um, Darrell Rivas. Um, 
Richard Seymour, going back to the old, older Patriots. Um, Patrick Pass is a random one. <laughs> yes, and George. let's go Matt, Matt Light, offensive lineman. Matt Light. Oh, my goodness. Like, I, like I almost want to tap out right there. Like, <laughs> how do you beat Matt Light? Um, man, that's crazy. You, I, can't, I, I don't think I can do this, man. I think, I think Matt Light <laughs> is pretty thick. That's fantastic. I, I could have gone Dan Connolly. Wow. That's, 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 that's the, the, bread, uh, the, the loaf of bread carry. That's... Chris Collinsworth call. He's going down the field. Matt Flynn's starting for the Packers and the after Rodgers had the concussion. And all of a sudden you get this kick and Dan Connolly's running down the field to about the four yard line. Dan Connolly, <laughs> man. And that you, you Collinsworth makes makes me think I should have I should have started this this uh this podcast with you know, that Collinsworth slide, you know. <laughs> all right, kinda... let's let's go Packers and just kind of just name who I can go maybe to the 2001, 2002, if you want to go back yeah. that far. Yeah, that's fine. Do uh, you want to start? Yeah, I'll start it out. Okay. Uh, David Bakhtiari, TJ Lang, Josh Sitton, Elton Jenkins, Billy Turner. Okay. Um, Brett Favre, Aaron Rodgers, Doug Peterson, Craig Nall, who was one of my favorite Favre backups. Um. Gotta be random here. Uh, I'll go Jake Kumaro. <laughs> right. Chad Clifton. Uh, I, I don't know why I'm on the lineman, but I'm on the lineman right now. Uh, Chad Clifton, Darren College, and then why don't why don't we uh, skip it out and go to Michael Finley, Rob Havenstein, and uh, Jimmy Graham? Okay, Jeremy Capinos, Josh Bidwell, um, <laughs> John Ryan. Uh, who is the other? Tim Maste, um, and Mason Crosby. I had to. I had to look way back. <laughs> You're going way back there. I had to look way off in the distance to see where you were going there. That's that's big. Um, Al Harris, Atari, Big B, Nick Collins, Charles Woodson, Sam Shields. Well, it's better named Charles Woodson. He just made the damn Hall of Fame. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. You know, Packers. He's one of the best. <laughs> Antonio Freeman, um, lacrosse grad Bill Schrader, um, Corey Bradford. Um, did we name Driver? No. Oh, Donald Driver. Uh, one of my favorites from one the one year that he was even on the Packers, um, Terry Glenn. Terry Glenn. <laughs> Man. So you're always coming through with these like great obscure ones at the at the back end there. All right. So that's what you get for playing so many versions of Madden that you just kind of realize who they've had all through these years. Yeah. You're a gamer. You're a veteran in the gaming, gaming uh world, no doubt about that. Um all right, then uh then then let's do uh I was thinking like defensive line because we haven't touched those, right? So like Ryan Pickett, um uh, Cullen Jenkins, BJ Raji, you know, you can tell what I've been studying lately. Um, uh, Kenny Clark and Zadarius Smith. Okay. I'm surprised you didn't bring this one up. Kambir Baja Biamila. <laughs> Leroy Butler. Um, who else could I go here? Charlie Petra. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Was, uh, how far back are you going? Because Butler was 90s, right? You was still in like Madden 2002. Oh, I guess, yeah, he'd still be around. Yeah. Um, I went Pepra, um, Aaron Ross, um, and Clay Aaron Matthews. Ross was on that team? Texas product, Aaron Ross? Uh, Aaron Rouse, was there oh, a Aaron safety? Rouse. Yeah. Yeah. No, okay. I know you're talking about now. Because I was thinking, like, I remember Aaron Ross, he got drafted by the um, uh, Giants, I thought. Yeah. Okay. Um. All right, let's see. Let's let's go. Let's go. Clay Matthews, AJ Hawk. I'm kind of just named Clay. Oh yeah, I'm I'm hitting a low hanging fruit. <laughs> um, yeah, AJ Hawk, uh, Brandon Jackson, Corey Hall, John Coon, and uh, who was who was big boy that that uh, that played for him last year? The big fullback. Um, why am I blanking on that name? 
I'm thinking of him, but I'm tempted to say He's it. Like, and then to, he was I can huge. think of two fullbacks. I can think of take think of two fullbacks right now, and I know the one that you're thinking of. So he was such a he was a big boy. Well, all right, we'll go Ryan Grant. Okay, Danny Vitelli, um, Aaron yeah. Rupkowski, Mercedes yeah. Lewis, um, Marquez Valdez Scantling, and I throw a weird one in there, Brandon Schiller. Brandon Schiller, that's a good point. <laughs> give me, uh, give me, like, like, can I use Taysom Hill? Is that a is that an option? I mean, if you can use Taysom Hill, I can use Matt Blanchard. All right. Well, I mean, we'll do. We'll I'll have about one practice squad a piece. Yeah. Okay. Taysom, Taysom Hill, uh, Graham Harrell, B.J. Coleman was that his name? I think so. Yeah. Um, Vin, we'll see, but Vince Young was also just a preseason guy. Vince didn't play for them in the regular season, so I can't. I can't use Vince. College superstar, but I can't use Vince. Yeah, I'll tap out. It's your. It's your win. Okay. That, that's impressive. That's good. All right. <laughs> I'll give you a test here. Can you name the quarterbacks that have beaten Tom Brady in the playoffs? Wow. All right. I have to think about, uh, like, I'm sure Peyton Manning had to have done it once. Yes. He's on there. Um, did Roethlisberger ever do it? Uh, I think so. How many? Do you know how many? I, I think it was, yeah, Peyton, Eli, Joe Flacco. Mark Sanchez. Mark Sanchez? That was the year they made the champ conference championship game. Oh, man. And then you'd probably have Roethlisberger in there. And then... um, Nobody on the NFC side, I can tell you that. Nick Foles. Nick Foles! (laughs) I had stumped you there. Um, Uh, And I think the seventh one, I think there were seven. um, Jake the Snake Plumber. Wow, way, way Denver back. Broncos, Denver Broncos, because they beat them to go to the AFC title game to play Roethlisberger. Yeah, that's – yeah, that would – and Jake the Snake was – here's the thing. Like, Jake the Snake was probably like the Matt Stafford of his era, you know? Like, he was always, always good for teams that weren't always, always good. He he was he was always a good performer. Uh, I, the, the Nick Foles thing is, is, uh, is fast. Of course, you know, Philly special and all of that. But uh, I am uh, – I covered Nick Foles when he was in high school. Uh, when I was working in, in Austin, I worked in the Austin market for a while, and he was a high school quarterback at the big the big football powerhouse high school in that area. And uh, that is the largest hand I have ever shaken. He was 18 years old, and I, I went to do a pregame or a practice day interview with him, and his hand swallowed my hand, and that does not happen. That's crazy. So whose hand was bigger, Nick Foles or Giannis Sedanacumpo? Well, yeah, I mean, I, and I don't know if I've ever shaken Giannis' hand, so I don't know if I can, if I can say that, you know? Okay. I don't know if I know. It, it would be interesting to see, because obviously you're talking about, like, or Shaq or someone, you're talking about, like, seven feet of, of you know, height. So, they're, yeah, they're going to have huge hands. But I'm telling you, Nick, Nick Foles, it was like, it was a shock. I mean, you know, and he was, I don't know, 6'4", six, 6'5", six, whatever he is. Uh, but, uh, yeah, it was that, and he was 18. He looked just like John Elway when he was 18. It just like almost, a, almost looked like he was like John Elway's kid. All right. So do you want to just call this and. Sounds good to me. All I, right. uh, I appreciate it. This was fun. We, we had a chance to kind of, to chat some things out. I would be curious to see the direction that this goes in. Now, here's, here's my other question for you as we, as we go out, do you have a name? I was going to go podcast on D shot because that could be really anything. Yeah. Okay. And like trying it. to do stuff with my former sports editor and he kind of got me back into this. So yeah, good enough. I'd say, Hey, it's a great thing to do. You see a ton of people on the podcast realm. Uh, I, I'm going to admit I have a podcast microphone, like a setup, but I haven't used it for yet. Yeah. You're, you're, you're ready. That's, it's the it's the wave of the future, man. You can you can get this to everyone that has the ability to see it. You know what I mean? Like that you you don't you don't have to have cable. You know you can just log onto your computer and, and watch it. So uh, uh, it's a nice venture. Good luck with that. Yeah, how impressed with the the naming of players were you? Oh, dude, you're all over it. Um, <laughs> that's 
that's a man that's uh, that's done some things. I, I I would like to think that I would have been more competitive with a cup of coffee, but maybe not. <laughs> would you, would you be up for doing a Brewers one? I want I want to do some sort of Brewers retrospective, and I want to kind of get a uh, Tom Hodgecourt somehow to do like a uh, twenty years of Miller Park and top plays and top moments that kind of stick out from twenty years. Yeah, let me know. You're you're probably thinking like late March, April, something like that. Yeah. Yeah. My life gets a little crazier at that time, but we'll make it work. It's okay. uh, yeah. Just like, like this time of day is probably going to be better. You know, when the, when the tournament comes, our lives get nutty, but then when the Badgers get knocked out, my life is wide open. <laughs> okay. All right, Kevin, thanks for joining me on the debut episode of podcast on D shot podcast on D shot count it. I am glad to be a part of history here. Thanks for having me. All right. Thanks, dude.